Hi, I'm uh, Greg Fricky. I got my bachelor's degree from Caltech, master's degree from Duke, and I'm currently a PhD candidate there. I've worked for Hughes Space and Communication, three different groups within the Boeing company, and I currently work for Lord Corporation here in Cary. I've built and worked on telescopes for the Air Force, and I've discovered asteroids. I've worked on the software and control systems for high energy laser pointing systems and helicopter active vibration control and for satellites as well. I spent most of the last decade researching and developing controls for distributed robotic systems. And all of that is because my natural curiosity was fostered by passionate teachers and mentors such as yourselves. Thank you for being those people for our next generation. Today I'd like to talk about robotic swarms and why they're neat, at least to me. Why do we call them swarms? What comes to your mind when you hear swarm? Bees or ants, termites? We sometimes call them flocks or shoals if we're basing our robot system on birds and fish. Bottom line is that we in this field of robotics take inspiration from the natural world around us. How do geese fly in the very recognizable V formations? Perhaps more importantly, why do they create those forms? How does a swarm of ants or termites know how to build a massive dirt hive? Individually, they're very simple and small creatures, but together they can create massive complex structures. And furthermore, if one ant or a hundred ants are killed from the hive, the remaining ants still have no problem completing that hive or carrying back that dead bug. Sometimes the how is more interesting and sometimes the why. We have to ask those different questions. Robots are typically said to be most suited to the three Ds, dirty, dull, and dangerous work. We know that manufacturing robots are used in widespread use all over the world in these types of applications, producing hundreds or thousands of parts per day, oftentimes exposed to thermal or chemical environments that could cause serious harm to humans. In pop culture, we often think about robots as being very advanced, robot-human hybrids, Terminator, Johnny Five, Data, Rosie from the Jetsons, of course, R2-D2 and C-3PO. What's difficult to realize, though, is that robots such as these are extremely complex and expensive machines requiring huge computational ability, tons of extremely sophisticated software, and absurd quantities of energy. The only reason to have robots like this is because they're designed to look like us and behave like us, like humans, and we want to interact with them as if they're our friends. If we apply the three Ds to mobile robots, there are some obvious applications where individual complex robots can handle dirty and dull work, like farming very large crop fields automatically. But that's more likely to be a tractor with an autopilot, not C-3PO. Or applying fertilizer and pesticides to that same field would more likely be done with an unmanned aerial vehicle rather than a humanoid bipedal robot. What about dangerous work? If a robot is too complex, it requires too much precision, depends on a particular means of locomotion or a refined surface to walk on, it could be easily disabled or destroyed in a dangerous situation. And if it's a very expensive robot, you could be out a lot of money. If instead we look towards simpler robots inspired by simple natural creatures and their simple natural interactions, it becomes clear that there are many advantages depending on their intended application. Imagine a scenario such as the one that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, the Deepwater Horizons explosion. After the initial explosion, oil immediately began leaking from the opened well on the ocean floor. The only way to monitor this gushing oil was to send very expensive, unmanned, remotely operated submarine to the ocean floor to take video with expensive high-resolution cameras. This is one application where building an autonomous submarine would make a lot of sense could make a good argument for that. But that robot could only inspect one location at any given time, rather than the entire plume that extended for miles. And what if that submarine was damaged down there at the bottom of the sea? Immediately the sy system no longer is functional, and there's no more information coming in, and you're out a lot of money. Consider instead many robots, dozens, hundreds, or thousands of them, linked together by short-range communication, Maybe all the robots have slight differences. Some have cameras, some have illumination capabilities, some have hydrocarbon sensors. With very simple rules, with relatively simple software, 
rather than extremely high-level artificial intelligence, these robots could distribute themselves around the active plume of oil, giving a much larger picture, three dimensions. And in this configuration, if one or even some of the robots become partially or completely disabled, the remaining robots can redistribute themselves, reallocating themselves to heal the communication network and fill in the remaining sensing gaps to maintain coverage of the spill. We call this graceful degradation, and it's one of the most obvious benefits of robot swarms. With a system like this, the estimates of the size of the oil plume could have been much more accurate. We recall there was widely disparate estimates. If you recall, there was another problem with the spill. Where did all the oil go? There was no way to track the oil as it spread throughout the Gulf. But if there had been a robot swarm deployed, the oil could have been tracked as it broke into distinct globs, some of it reaching the surface, some of it staying submerged and getting caught in the currents. This ability of a swarm to split or merge in order to maintain its tracking target is another great, great feature of swarms that individual, highly capable robots do not have. Another perfect application for a robot swarm was the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor uh, tragedy uh, that were damaged by the massive tsunami in 2011. Many robots could cover this large area, providing real-time three-dimensional picture. Furthermore, rather than requiring robots whose sensitive electronics and sensors would need to be hardened against radiation damage, the robots could be made much more inexpensively, knowing that they may fail, but knowing also that if they do fail, the rest would continue to work, continuing to give you a picture. Some of the research I conducted at Duke was related to perimeter identification and tracking, similar to the Deepwater Horizon spill. This is a short video demonstrating our simple algorithm for perimeter tracking. These robots are very, very simple robots, and their sensing ability is practically nothing, but it's sufficient to find a perimeter. If the robots are close enough to one another, if they're within communication range, they share relevant information about their situation, specifically whether they're tracking the spill or not. Any other robot that's within communication range but not tracking the spill immediately moves towards the tracking robot. Quite quickly, then, the robots all find the spill and furthermore distribute themselves evenly around the perimeter. This automatic even distribution also allows the swarm to react dynamically if the shape of the perimeter should change, or even if it splits into two or more distinct perimeters, as shown in this animation. This animation uh, is from a real experiment. This is the tracking data, but we unfortunately lost the raw video. This is pretty much all I have. This is the final slide, and we're going to wait for the end of it here as the uh, split's going to happen. There it goes. So it changes shape, and they continue to redistribute. It splits, and one robot happens to be on that portion and continues to track it. And then it comes together, and they gracefully merge together again. Well, hopefully you'll agree with me that robot swarms are really neat. And uh, again, thank you, teachers and mentors. Yeah, does anybody have any uh, questions about that? Sorry, I, I think I spoke pretty quickly. <laughs> So that was um, a very, very simple algorithm just doing an edge detection. So they have infrared downward looking sensors you know, that just looks for a, a change in reflectivity. So it was a white floor with an you know, infrared beam on one side and a sensor on the other side. So if we see the sensor level change, we know that we've you know, found the edge. It had five different sensors on the front so you could kind of center the robot on that edge. You know, if you find it, kind of move a little more, move a little more, and then you're, oh, now they're all covered, so you get back to the edge. So that was mostly just to demonstrate the tracking, the communication and sharing algorithm rather than that. So, so the algorithm that we developed would be applicable to any system that had appropriate sensing capability. So soon after the Deepwater Horizon spill, MIT came out with uh, a few different studies where they had individual robots that had hydrocarbon sensors, like I mentioned, that would have been able to uh, follow gradients 
of concentrations of oil and get closer and closer. If they had a navigation algorithm like this along with that and you had several hundred robots, then they would easily distribute themselves around the spill. Um, same thing goes with radiation, you know, following the gradient to find it.